Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all, to all who are able to join us here in the sanctuary this afternoon. We are very pleased to have you here. We are continuing with live streaming and I think we're maybe live at home. So for those who are joining us over the live stream, you too are welcome in this place. By whatever means you join us, welcome to worship from Orchard Hill Church. Much has happened since many of us were last in this place. Much sadness and much joy. We light our candle here in the church as a marker that we come now in this time and this place before God who knows our pain and our delights. We reflect on this as we hear a member of our choir sing the introit as we are gathered. It has been our practice over these last few months to say together the ancient words of faith from the Psalms. And today our Psalm is Psalm 24, one that is often sung during a communion service. So we'll stand together and David will play an introduction and we'll speak the words in yellow on the screen. Let's stand. gates, lift up your heads on high, ye doors that last for aye, be lifted up that so the King of glory enter may. But who of glory is the King? The mighty Lord is this, even that same Lord that great in might and strong in battle is, even that same Lord that great in might and strong in battle is. Ye gates, lift up your heads, ye doors, doors that do last for aye, be lifted up, that so the King of glory enter me. But who is he that is the King of glory? Who is this, the Lord of hosts, and none but he the King of glory is? The Lord of hosts, and none but he the King of glory is. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Please be seated. We come now to the time in our service where we pray. We come before God who wants to hear from his people. Let us pray. Holy One, you anoint us with living water so we may go and serve in the world in these troubled days. You open our eyes so we will see everyone as our sisters and brothers. We may not be able to confront queens or challenge presidents. We may not have the capacity to divert resources or uplift communities. We may not have the voice to silence the noise of war or the words to negotiate peace between armies. But as we follow you, O Christ, we are able to do something. 
seed planter. You place faith deep within us so we can bear witness to your just and loving kingdom. Your love regulates our hearts so we can welcome all in your name. And so we pray that you would inspire us to commit to and act on the small differences that we can make. May we bring peace through small acts of gentleness and reconciliation. May we bring wealth through small contributions and collaborations. May we bring safety through small acts of consideration and acceptance. May we bring wholeness through small acts of care and service. Gentle spirit, when we cannot see the way, you take us by the hand so we can step forward in faith. You fill us with hope so we can sing God's joy all of our days. And in the small ways, O oh God, may our small difference make a big contribution to your saving work in our world. God in community, holy in one, hear us as we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We hear again from Carol, who is in our choir. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim, will remain seated and listen to this act of praise. Our readings today are read for us by Anne Barr, who can't be with us in person, so we have a recording. Let's listen now to the Word of God. The reading this morning is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 34 
through to chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I named to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The second reading is from Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day. And the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading of his word. 
If you were here this morning, we had more members of the choir, but today we're, we're really pleased. We've got Carol who's joining us, and we're really, for all these months, we've had recorded music in church, and so it's a real pleasure, a real pleasure to have live music. And we're being spoiled today because we've got another special item. The choir, as many of you know, over lockdown, recorded lots of pieces um, individually, and they were put together through the wonders of technology. And this, what we're about to play now, is our final lockdown anthem. And it's John Rutter's For the Beauty of the Earth. We love it, don't we, when the little guy wins, when we hear stories of those who are seen as the underdog and they triumph over those who are strong and powerful, when the middle-aged lady stands on the stage uncertainly and then belts out the most amazing song. We remember too the Euros back in 2004 when Greece won. They were just not expected to beat the home team, the team that was worth millions, the team that had the football giants in the squad. But they did. They came together and they won against all the odds. 
I don't know if we've got any football fans in today and who are we rooting for this time? The underdogs, I hope, we're for Scotland, the home team. What do we say? We say, yes, sir, I can boogie. The lectionary readings this week talk much about the underrated. We've got two parables about the reign of God. The first tells about the kingdom being like seeds that are left to their own devices. And the second parable compares the kingdom of God to one of the smallest seeds on the world. And our own Testament reading gives us the classic underdog story, the story of David, the unlikely king. These readings present us with conundrums that are not easily squared away, with mysteries that leave us a wee bit unsatisfied. Why is the kingdom not compared to a mighty oak tree or a magnificent cedar? And it's here that maybe we can agree something that we've long suspected. God has a sense of humour. This was a well-known story in Israel. It was told in the book of Ezekiel, where Israel is depicted as a sprig taken from the cedar tree and is planted on the mountain top, where it grew into a mighty tree, and the birds of the air came and nest in its mighty branches. And for tiny Israel, this story was encouraging and optimistic. The story of the anointing of David as king follows a similar line. The unlikely boy, the youngest, the most insignificant, he becomes the king. He's young, forgotten about, he's not even invited to the sacrifice, yet he becomes the one who will defeat Goliath, the classic underdog overcoming the big guy story. And we love these stories, we always have. The little branch grows into the mighty tree and we can all stand and cheer and feel really good. And in the second reading, we hear Jesus about to launch into such a story. The kingdom of God is, and we wait expectantly. This tiny seed will grow into something magnificent, a huge tree. But no, Jesus says it will grow into a shrub, a great shrub, but it's still a shrub. And this is a bit of a letdown. It's just a shrub. It's not even an amazing shrub. It's something that's a bit innocuous. It's somewhere that gets everywhere. It's a bit of a weed. And now this is not what we're expecting. And I'm sure Jesus knew the Ezekiel story well and perhaps told this parable with a twinkle in his eye. We read the Bible not because it gives us morals to live our lives by, but because it tells the truth about us and about God. God engages with us through his word. He wins our trust by showing that he knows the truth about us. And here's the truth about us. We don't want to be a weed. We want to be a mighty cedar. We want the greatness, the applause of the world. We want to be the underdog picked out by Samuel, anointed as king. These can be uncomfortable truths, but I don't think Jesus has been mean when he tells this parable. He's encouraging the Israelites and us to see that the culture of God, the culture of God's kingdom is not like that of the world's. And there's nothing new under the sun. We remember when John the baptizer first made contact with Jesus when he first came on the scene and he asked, are you the one? Because honestly, I was expecting a bit more. And even after Jesus' death and resurrection, we remember the disciples asking, right, surely this is the time when you're going to restore Israel to its glory. Surely this is the moment. And we can all be guilty of wanting to bring back the glory days, but that is not in the pattern of God. In the first Samuel story, the line of David begins, and in Jesus, we have the son of David, the one who was born in David's city, the least of all the towns, who was anointed obscurely, who displaced the powers that be of his time. And this man, this Jesus, doesn't say that the kingdom of God comes through magnificent institutions with spectacular results. He didn't say, you're going to be a great army marching into the world, or you're to build a political organization that will overthrow, or will use shock and awe and power. Instead, Jesus spoke of mustard seeds, one of the smallest seeds on the planet. There were no fireworks, no magic tricks. Instead, he healed one person at a time. He taught and he spoke and he gave hope to a person here 
and a person there. And finally, when the powerful of this world got organized enough to put a stop to him, Jesus did not take up his sword as the followers wanted him to do. He did not call down 10,000 angels as the old song said he could. He gave away his life. He surrendered power. He died on the cross. And three days later, he was resurrected. But there was no fanfare, still no fireworks, no press conferences. Mary discovers him in the garden, thinking he was a humble gardener. And he unassumingly joins the three disciples on the walk to Emmaus. And this can be hard to fathom, difficult to take on board, especially on a personal level, because we are trained by our culture, by our society, to believe that only the successful, only the powerful, only the best are good enough. And this leads to people feeling inadequate, that their failures, not good enough. They think, we think, that we have to be the mighty cedars and feel disappointed when we realise that we're only a shrub. What does this say for us? That we don't have to be amazing, we don't have to be the best at everything, the trendiest or the youngest or the best biblical scholar. And it's not to say that we don't have to try and we don't have to pay attention to what God is doing in this world. But we don't have to pretend to be something that we're not. God knows what we're like and he loves us anyway. This is a relief, certainly to me, but it's also a challenge. Now we can't say, well, I can't do that, I'm not good enough. This parable, the Bible, the whole of Jesus' life tears down that lie that we tell ourselves and others. The Bible says over and over again, you are enough. You are enough. Jesus died for you, just as you are. The coming of the kingdom of God, God's reign, is not a juggernaut that's going to wipe out everything in its path. It's not the favorite team that's going to win the Euros. It's humble, it's unassuming, and that's why many people underestimate it, overlook it, and shrug off the claim that it has over their lives. The kingdom of God is here, and it's not about grand gestures or amazing wins, but it is about being faithful, keeping going, coming back even when it feels hard, persevering even though we've got to wear a mask and we can't sing, reaching out to those who are lonely, smiling at the annoying neighbor, being generous with what we have, being real, little by little, being transformed, and by our transformations, seeing the kingdom of God become a reality in our world. Every act of service, every effort of justice, every act of peace, healing and reconciliation will not be overlooked by God, but will someday bring forth results that we cannot imagine. God is redeeming his world through mustard seed churches and ordinary people who give themselves to the love and grace of God. Ordinary people, ordinary items, and God uses them in extraordinary ways. Through his love, God transforms the tiniest and most impotent seed into a bush that can give rest to the singing birds. Through God's grace, his kingdom grows from tiny beginnings, from a motley crew who became a worldwide revolution. And these people in and of themselves were nothing special, but when God transformed them, they became more than they could ever have imagined. Now, I don't want to push Jesus' analogy too far, but I do believe, however, that Jesus in this parable gives us hope that through such small and humble efforts, God will bring about his kingdom. God works in and through simple things like bread and wine, singing hymns, whispered prayers before we fall asleep, reading the Bible, serving the needy, forgiving our enemies, being forgiven. God's kingdom is hard to fathom. It's mysterious and it can't be explained away. This is a part of the mystery of faith and we enter into this today. We come to this table, a table where all are welcome, a table 
whose bounds have no limits, a table that invites us into a glorious mystery where we accept there is more than we can see. Looking at our communion elements today, they're nothing special in amongst themselves. They're nothing special, but through the Spirit, they will be set apart and become for us holy. God is present in who and what we are. He is with us in all of our imperfect ways, in our uncertainties and in our failures. He's with us in the tiny plastic cups of wine and wafers of bread, just as much as he's with us in the abundant loaves and fine goblets. And this is the mystery of our faith, that God wants us as we are, not as who we'd like to be, but as we are. Amen. We hear Carol sing, Through saints we glimpse the light of Christ. We've heard from the Word of God, and now we can consider some of the ways that we can serve and give of ourselves in response to this Word. Here are our announcements. People continue to be generous in bringing food for the food bank over at Cairn Wardrick, and your gifts are still needed and welcome. They can be left here on the church um, at the door there um, between 10 and 12 on a Wednesday. As we move into the summer holidays, we're planning on still meeting on a Wednesday morning, but hoping to move into a more in-person format. We're glad to invite people to join us this week if you're free at 11 for a coffee at Rook and Glen Garden Centre coffee shop. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't want people going to the wrong, place, <laughs> the wrong place. We'll be sticking to the COVID restrictions and we'll still have a chance to build up and sustain friendships. Please, if you want more information, feel free to speak to me. But otherwise, Wednesday at 11, we'll see you in the car park. Please join us. On Wednesday evening, we continue holding our quiet time services, which are a 15-minute 
lovely time of contemplation. I really strongly encourage you to join us and the details are on the website. It's, a, it's Currently we, we do this via Zoom, so please feel free to come along. We are having tea and coffee after our service today, so please feel free to stay and join us for a quick cuppa. We'll follow the signs through to the hall and we'll sit at tables there, households, no more than three households at a table, um, and we've got to remain in our seat, we can't wander about, so your tea or coffee will be served to you. But please feel free to join us. There's also um, the booklet on the, the tales of the pandemic that was curated by Maureen Richard Park about the, the jaunt to Jerusalem that many in Orchard Hill went on last year, virtually over the summer. You can collect a, a booklet and leave a donation for the Roof Fund if you so wish. We are also uplifting our attiral offering today for Easter End Good Causes. There will be a plate in the, amongst the coffee and also at the door. These, I think, are all our announcements. <coughs> oh, sorry, session meeting. That was what I forgot. Yes, there's a session meeting and a congregational board meeting on Thursday the 17th and the details will be sent out uh, via um, email to the people who that is appropriate for. And that is all our announcements. So we take a moment now to reflect on all that we have and to give off ourselves back to God. We'll stand together as we hear the doxology played by David and sung by Carol. Let's stand. be seated. All that we give to God is in response to God's great love for us and in this time of worship our giving is wrapped in the first giving of God to us in God's word and now in the sacrament that we share. Paul's concern was that in Corinth people did not make enough effort to be together and to demonstrate their unity. And in these times, when government legislation and a sense of care for all meant that we could not gather physically, we did not celebrate the sacraments as we might have wished. But today, we've been able to gather in larger numbers and through the live stream, and we come together as Christ's folk. We praise God together, and we recognise that we are one in Christ. You who love the Lord and are among those loved by God, draw near to this holy table set in many places and hear the gracious words of Jesus Christ. He said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall rest in your souls. I am the bread of life, Jesus told all who would listen. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, Whoever believes on me shall never thirst. Anyone who comes to me, I will in no way cast out. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I invite you just now to take your wee communion elements out of your bag. And if you're able, if you can peel back the top layer just to reveal the bread. But we'll wait and we'll eat together. So just peel back the top layer to reveal the bread. But we'll wait and eat together.
Let us hear from St. Paul how this sacrament began. The tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself, that on the night in which he was handed over, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. As the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was handed over, took bread and wine, we take these elements of bread and wine to be set apart from all common uses to this holy use and mystery. And as he gave thanks and blessed, let us draw near to God and offer to him our prayers and our thanksgiving. Let us pray. Living God, we acclaim you, majestic in holiness, worthy of praise, worker of wonders. In the beginning you created the universe. You made the sun and moon above our heads the earth beneath our feet. Your word brought forth the rocks and streams, the surging seas, the wild winds and the mild. You fashioned life in all its thousand, thousand forms and shaped from clay the wonder of the human frame. You spoke your word to those whom you had chosen. In disobedience they turned from your commands. You came yourself in Christ, the Word made flesh, but he was shunned, despised by all, forsaken in the darkness of the cross. You made the tree of death, the tree of life, the empty grave, a sign of glorious hope. You raised your son and brought him to your side again, where now he lives to pray on our behalf. Therefore, with all your people and with the whole company of heaven, we praise you in the angel's hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now we celebrate the feast of our redemption and proclaim the death of Jesus and announce his resurrection and ascension until he comes in glory. Send down your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may become for us the body and blood of your most dear Son, and that we may become for you his living body, loving and caring for the world until the dawning of the perfect day. Most gracious God, accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and receive the offering of ourselves, which now we make, our thoughts and words, desires and deeds. Gather into one in your kingdom all who share this bread and this cup, that with the faithful of all the ages, we may with one voice and one heart glorify your name, O God, Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit. Amen. We do this in obedience to Christ's example and command. On the night when he was handed over, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. When you gather to eat, you should all eat together. We take this bread together as a sign of our unity in Christ. Take, eat. This is the body of Christ, which is for you. Do this, remembering him. Carefully peel back your lid to reveal the wine. This cup is the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, which was shed that the sins of the many might be forgiven. Drink from it, all of you. This is Christ's blood shed for you. Peace of Christ, above all peace, be with you. Now we will be led in our prayers, prayers for ourselves and for our world, and our prayers will be led for us by David Howard. David. Let us pray. Loving God, this is your day. Help us to use it wisely to rejoice and be glad in it, and so worship you joyfully in spirit and in faithfulness. Go with us always when we enter your house or worshiping you from our homes, and help us with all our hearts to praise you in our prayers and to offer our lives to you in heartfelt gratitude for all that you have done for us. At this important time for our own congregation, we ask for your wisdom and guidance for our nominating committee as they seek our new minister to lead us in worship and in the new directions that you want us to go for the furtherance of your kingdom in this corner of your world. And for the wider church in Scotland, as all our congregations are faced with significant changes in the national church's structures due to a lack of new recruits to the ministry and falling membership, 
Grant us patience and energy and clear thinking as we seek to reshape your church here in Scotland, but still to continue proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and to continue to teach our children and nurture new believers in the great truths taught by Jesus, Paul, and the other disciples for the continued advancement of your kingdom here in Scotland. We ask for your blessing on John Miller, our interim moderator, on Gillian Rooney, our probation minister, who has had to shoulder greater responsibility than might have been expected by her, and on Lorna Buchan, who so clearly has such a good way with our young people. And we give you our thanks for all those in the background who give their time, energy, and knowledge of the technicalities to provide us the means of reaching us all with services and church meetings. We ask for your blessing on them all for their service and guidance at this vital time. We also pray for all those in our National Health Service and those working in care homes who have given their all to protect as many as possible through the vaccination programme and in looking after those in our hospitals and in the homes for the elderly. We pray for the many trouble spots in our world where people are suffering from war, famine and diseases in places such as the Yemen, Tigray in Ethiopia and in India. And we pray for the many aid agencies working to make life safer for all those caught up in wars and strife in our world. Be with us now as we go from church or partaking in worship from our homes. Be with us in all our comings and goings this day and for the opportunities to meet with friends and families once more. Be with us in our conversations and actions and in all our ways express your loving presence in our daily lives by loving and caring for all those that we meet or have conversation with. And now, refreshed in spirit, mind and body, may we be better fitted for the many duties and opportunities that lie before us in this coming week and in the months that lie ahead. All this we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, David. We move towards our closing hymn. I would like to say on behalf of Gillian and myself, who have had such a privilege in helping to lead the service today, that to be with everyone like this has been a great pleasure and wonderful to hear live music and the live human voice singing to us, something which I think all of us will remember and has made today very special. Our closing hymn. Glory to you, O God, for all your saints in light. Again, if you're able, I invite you to stand.
spirit stirred in humble paths to live your life and speak your word. Unnumbered they, whose shining light informs our sight from Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and forever.